study session to order. Mayor Pankinen will not be here, and uh, Commissioner Waddell will not be present tonight. I'm acting mayor, filling in for Mayor um, Pankinen. On tonight's agenda, item two, at the commissioner's request, discuss any item of concern on the regular session agenda of July the 2nd, 2019. Does anyone have any discussions or concerns? I just wanted to ask about, there was under consent items, there was a mowing thing, and I was just kind of wanting to cover that just a little bit more. Uh, yes, I think that's mowing for the entryways. Is that what it is? Is that right, Everett? Yeah. Do you want to explain to the commission what we're doing there? Yes. Yeah, the you want to go ahead and stand, come in. Go stand up and come on up to the microphone. You're on TV. Yeah. It's, it's the uh, four entry ways into uh, the city coming on all four highways. We contract those out every year to help us keep up with the mowing. Uh, this year, we extended to North Highway to help us out a little more. We, we took on some more jobs that we're doing, so we brought it all the way to Poplar. That's the only change we've made. So other than that, the same thing we've been doing for the last few years. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. All right, we started that effort several years ago to help basically contract out some of the services mm -hmm. so that our street department could focus more on the streets and not just mowing in the summertime. Yes. So that's, that's the intent of the effort. And so there's three companies uh, that are going to be doing it, or are we going to select one of them? Right, no. We, we bid them all out separately uh -huh. because there's no way one company can keep up with all four and keep it the way we want it maintained. I see. So we let everybody bid on it. Uh, the most it's ever been was one company had three of them, mm -hmm. and that got a little out of hand. So I think this year, two one company's got two of them, and then it's split on the other. So it's uh, a lot easier to keep up with that way. We've done contract mowing in the past in yes. all different kinds of ways. And so uh, I just was wondering about that. So great, that answers my question. All Thank right. you very much. I, I've got two questions. On uh, on the agenda on page 147 where uh, it talks about the agreement for bond council services. Just, I, I think I fully understand that, but could, could someone, is that just the group of people that are helping us with securing the bonding and the financing, that, that's what that is, right? It's just an agreement with them? Yes, the city has a long-term arrangement, uh, arrangement, a long-term relationship with um, <coughs> public law finance group or bond council for any kind of refinancing or new debt issue, like the Call Lake financing. And we also use municipal finance services as our financial advisor, and these are We've used those two companies probably at least since the 90s, and maybe we might have been using them when you guys were on last time. Uh, we used well. them in the, uh, in, the early, in the late 80s, and yes. Yeah, so it's a long-term relationship. Okay. They provide expertise uh, with their knowledge on financing, refinancing. Rick Smith, who started municipal finance, right. I worked for the water board, so it's okay. it very, okay. very helpful. And those guys will actually be here around six tonight. So if we're still going to study session, um, I'd be glad for them to introduce themselves and maybe help answer any questions you have. And upstairs, of course, they'll do a presentation on the refinancings, and, and uh, it's actually one on the wastewater debt. It's beneficial for us for really a couple of reasons, but they'll be here to to, to carry the water and stand the living. Okay. So. I, I thought that's what that was. I just wanted to make sure. Then my other question. Um, in one of the, I think it's a consent items where it talks about the pre, the pressure relief uh, line that's going to be put in. What is that exactly for? That's between Coke and our uh, plant, right? And and what does that pressure relief valve do? Does that lower the pressure down to Coke, or what it does is uh, we've had some. I won't say frequent line breaks, but we've had several line breaks since that line's been put in new, oh, several years ago. And so we've determined that probably as a preventative measure to water hammering that's going on uh, with Coke as they adjust their processes and using potable and non-potable water. Um, we've determined that uh, a water pressure relief valve is the best way to handle that. I believe it's out in the middle of the field. I don't know if Lou's here. Yeah, Lou, you want to explain it? <coughs> we've had several breaks on our 20-inch water line that goes out to coke, sir, and to to prevent us from having to go out there and dig up the pastures and, and taking care of a 20-inch water line, um, I asked engineer if they would put together a proposal or a plan, 
and they helped us out. And basically what happens if the pressure gets too high, if it's going to get high enough to blow a pipe, it'll blow off on that pressure relief at that time. It won't, it'll keep it from, it'll prevent it from blowing off the pipe. It's not going to reduce the pressure. It's not going to diminish the pressure in any way, shape or form. If the pressure spikes or gets to a high level, instead of breaking the pipe, it's going to, it's going to release okay. reduce the pressure. Okay. What's the pipe made out of? PVC, plastic. So it's that greenish Yes, sir. Pipe. Yes, sir. 20 inch. That's pretty big, isn't it? It's very thick. It's about that big. The last time we had one that blew off, it actually moved the 20 inch line six inches to the left. Underground? Underground. <clears throat> and that's why we asked for that pressure relief. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any other further discussion? Item three on the agenda, update on wayfinding signage from Lisa Powell. Gerald? I think Lisa will give this. And, and Michael, would you stand up for a minute, too? I don't know if the commission's met you yet or not. You're the new supervisor in technical services. Yes, sir. Michael worked for a long time for uh, Unifirst. That's right. And like 20 plus <coughs> years. And then he most recently worked for Mickey Stowers out at Aircraft Structures. And I believe we've been fortunate enough to get him as a supervisor here at the city. So he is in charge of the department that does wayfinding signage and street painting. Has, it, have, has anybody noticed street painting? Yes. There's a lot of it going on. It looks great. Yes. Even paint on an old street makes yes. the street look better. So that's his department, his people doing that. We appreciate the efforts of those city employees. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mayor and Commissioners and Gerald, City Manager. Um, appreciate the opportunity to update everybody on the Wayfinding Signage Initiative. Looking back at our records, it's been two years, I think, since we've been here to give you an update. And so we were recently meeting Michael and bringing his team up to speed with um, what, we've, what we are doing or hope to do in the way of installing some new signs and then um, learning what's happening um, in the process so far. So anyway, it's just a good time to get back and, and update everybody. And since we have so many new commissioners, I'm um, going to spend a little time on the history. And let me see, I've got the clicker here, don't I? There we go. This all originated out of our Enid First meetings. And so these are the groups that are involved in Enid First. Um, the, the group mainly focuses around marketing Enid and ways to improve the, the community for attraction of visitors and business. And in 2016, we hired Corbin Design, who is one of the leading um, sign design companies in the country. This is not Corbin Design here in Enid. They are out of um, Michigan. And so you can see some examples of the work they've done here in the region on signage. Uh, this is obviously for municipalities, but they also do signage for hospitals and other large um, complexes. The reasons that we believe that wayfinding signage is something necessary for Enid is, um, you know, our ultimate goal is to increase sales tax revenue. And um, I think a lot of our gems and retail and venues for people to go visit um, may be a little hidden to the visitor as they drive through on the main highways. We've got two large highways that uh, efficiently transport people through Enid, and so we want to find ways to draw their attention to things and places they can go and do outside of those highways. And so um, increasing the traffic to our retail and cultural venues, improve, improving the visitor experience. I'm sure everybody can think of those communities that you've been to or been through on vacation, and they do have really nice signage, and it always just makes your, your stay a little more convenient, a little easier. Um, we also think it will do a lot to speak to citizens because it, it does tie in with all of the branding that we've done for the community and so it is kind of a marketing stamp postcard out there on the streets and, and raising awareness again with our local citizens of all the things that Enid has available to do creates a sense of place. Um, and then another portion of this project is bullet number two there which is it, it is also removing an outdated signage um, that is no longer needed or dilapidated, faded, all those types of things. We have done this project in coordination with the Department of Transportation because we do have two large highways that go through Enid and um, they are 
They've been very supportive. Um, they have taken a look at our plans that have been developed because um, they can use it as a model for other places that um, do this kind of work in, in, the, in the state. Um, but they've also helped coordinate the location of a lot of these signs and agreed to help if any, if we identify any of their signage that needs to be replaced or repaired, um, they've been available to do that as a part of it. Uh, when Corbin was in town helping us to identify the locations where we need signage, these are some of the partners that were involved in the surveys and interviews that happened. <coughs> Here's some of the inspiration they used for designing the signs. So you can see some of the architectural features throughout the community that um, are represented in some of the signage we've developed. Um, Derwin has a copy of our design guidelines there that he's flipping through. So you can pass that around if you guys wanna take an up close look at uh, any of that. Just make sure I get it back because that is my working copy. Yeah, I have my name on it. So. <laughs> Okay, so here, um, obviously the gateway signs, we got placed a number of years ago, but it does tie in um, to all the other signage throughout town. That large sign there that says it's a vehicular guide, that is the largest sign, and those are the ones that you'll see on um, state highways 412 and 81. At the top of that sign is a red district sign that says district downtown. We've identified the community and broken it into at least three districts at this time. I think we've added a fourth um, that's not represented here on this slide, but we have downtown, we have the West Garriott District, and we have the Varsity District. Oh, and we have the Northwest District. That is the other one that would include um, properties north of Chestnut <coughs> on Cleveland and at Cleveland and Willow. So anyway, each one of those districts is a different color. And so when you have then a sign within that district, that sign will also have that same color represented. Um, this helps in providing directions to people on a map so that you can tell them that a general area we are within the downtown district or you need to go out towards the West Garriott district. Um, and then there at the end, those are pedestrian kiosks and you may have seen some of those that we have been able to install downtown. Here's the full sign type array. Um, some of these we may not necessarily use. Um, the fourth one over there is an opportunity to highlight any prominent members from Enid that we want to brag about and give homage to, and um, we don't have that one in place yet. And then these on the bottom row, those are your smaller signs that are going to be in your, on your city streets that are outside of the highway area. Includes parking signs, park signs, all of the above. Those that are just floating with no pole, those are ones that could be attached to an existing pole and wouldn't require a pole. In any case, so where we stand right now, um, total signs in the plan is about 100 signs. Today, so far, we have installed four of our entryway signs, six wayfinding signs, which are the um, large ones, both on the highway, and then there's a couple downtown along Grand that have been installed and three pedestrian kiosks downtown. We are waiting on right-of-way for two signs at the corner of Highway 81 and 412. And we have 13 parking lot signs that are in process and those will go around the parking lots um, near the Stride Bank Center. It will um, provide a, a name for each of those parking lots and identify them as public parking. And so those should be going up very soon as well. Uh, Mike's here to answer any questions. I know he's new on the job, but he's going up to speed quickly. Um, I think in talking with Mike and Gerald, uh, this year we may be using some more local vendors to assist in, assist in the fabrication. Um, up till now, we've used really a lot of talent that the city sign shop has had in the way of um, the ability to paint and weld and cut. Um, but that kind of talent comes and goes, and so we're going to look to fill in for some of that with some of the local vendors. We've been um, using an annual budget of about $50,000 a year. That $1,500 a sign is a non-scientific guess of what the cost is on average per sign. Obviously, your very large ones cost a bit more, and your smaller ones are obviously less. 
And we have also removed 18 signs similar to the one you'll see out there. Um, it says DHS Northern Oklahoma Resource Center, which is no longer there. So our next steps are um, the signs that we have I believe they're already made are those two that are waiting um, for right of way so those will go up when that's available uh, the parking signs i mentioned around the stride bank center and then we will get together as a team with the city to identify what is the next phase of signage that we want to get installed which i think our primary objectives is to do the highways first and then downtown as a second priority and then also identify, continue to identify any signs that are outdated and may need to be taken down. And with that, I will answer any questions, if you have any. Well, I, for one, think that signs are great. They're Thank real you. modern, they're, they're easy to read, they're placed well. We had way too many signs doing, <laughs> it's just confusing, it just looked bad. And I'm glad we're addressing this. So it looks like you've put a lot of thought and consideration into it. It looks like they will last a long time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Everything I'm about, about it is very hip, in my opinion. Yes, and it's interesting. I've learned way more about signage than I ever knew there was to know. Um, but the, the style and size of the font, the color of the font, the color of the paint for the background, the, the size of the sign, the number of items you put on the sign, <laughs> All of that is a science that this group, Corbin Design, you know, has figured out and they know how to do it well. And so I've been, we've been very pleased. Good job. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Item four, discuss C3 zoning ordinance. I believe that's going to be uh, Carol. Yes, um, last time we talked briefly about uh, providing R7 uses in C3. Uh, we, uh, we talked about it a little bit, and I've come up with two different um, ideas. We don't have to do anything, but if it would be a good idea, um, generally C3 accumulates the uses that are less intense. Um, so one of them just puts in our seven residential multifamily district uses within C3. Um, the other one, um, there was discussion about, well, what about unintended consequences or particular locations that wouldn't be good for R7? So we, I put in R7 residential multifamily district uses as a possible used by review um, that there already is a section that talks about any other similar business or service um, um, would be a used by review but this would ex expressly indicate that if you wanted to put an R7 use in C3 you could go to the Planning Commission and ask them to review it and approve it C3 has always kind of been the most catch-all permissive. Exactly. I think it was it was an oversight or an error that R7 wasn't already inc just included in it by default. Seems like this is not something we want to be trying to do with use by review. One thing that was mentioned last time it, <coughs> that was brought up by I think Commissioner Mason, which is a good point, is. We want to take some extra time to make sure we're not going to have unintended consequences. Right. If we do allow this in C3, that means anywhere in C3, if they decide they want to do something that's allowed under R7, they could do, which may be, if that's the intent of the commission, it would be clear to staff. But Carol's also offered another option with the use by review to allow it to be clear. We want to know what you guys yeah. want C3 to do. C3 already yeah. allows all this other stuff. I, I don't think there's anything in R7 that... I, I just don't think it's that big a deal. What well, was the concern? Uh, one of my concerns was that apparently that's the one that allows apartments, right? Uh huh. And that if we allow apartments to be put in any C3, that gives us any, it takes away any option that we have to actually review that if we want to. Yes. Uh, and however, 
But the underlying reason that I probably have a little bit of issue with this is I feel like we're making this change just for one entity. This feels, I don't feel like we're making this for one entity. It feels like this is something that came to our attention that we should have fixed at some point before. Um, and I don't, I mean, I just don't, I'm not sure what's objectionable about an apartment. We, our comp plan indicates that we want higher density residential, that we want more mixed use, that all our long-term planning indicates that higher density residential and mixed use is what is what we're seeking out. So why would we put a barrier in front of that? Because I think that with Hope Outreach wanting to put that boarding house down there, which I'm not opposed to, mm -hmm. but I think that when we do that, it's going to take the option of every property owner that lives around there, their option away from, away from them to come in and say, hey, I have an issue with this, or I want to know more about this, or uh, I want to have a voice in it. Yeah, but I'm not sure that a boarding house, I mean, if already see through three allows pool halls, bars, banks, business schools, car washes, discount stores, florists, furniture stores, grocery stores, kennel, that an apartment or boarding house, and it's also the, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm reluctant to, you know, if you own your piece of property and it's already zoned C3, it would be one thing if we were allowing big apartments in R2 or something like that, but, uh, but C3 is already C3. I mean, it's... Yeah, no, I, I understand that, but I know that when we did Jeremiah's deal, it caused a lot of problems. A lot of people had a voice on that, mm -hmm. still have a voice on that. And I just feel like by just including that in C3, we're now going, okay, we're going to take all that voice away from them because it's already zoned. Well, only if it's, in, only if it's zoned C3. I mean, C3 is not like I, I it's a, it's I, a I high bar to get to. I, I, any, do. Any, I understand yeah. that. But where they're talking about, there are other residential properties around there. Mm -hmm. We, we want mixed use. Mixed use is good. I, I understand that. Mostly yeah. apartments. I uh, mean, really close. I mean, right. just... Bar I understand. I'm thinking about the next one that comes up, Carol, that won't be right there. That's why I listened to you, and I said, if that's the issue, um, use by review gives a opportunity to look, but it doesn't require as... Um, it does not require as much of an expenditure of money for the process. It, mm -hmm. um, you post the property, it provides notice to the, to the people that live nearby, but you don't have to do the 300 foot list, and it isn't a down zoning. So what, what determines then how many of the property owners get notified on, on a use by review? Use by review, you put up a sign. Mm -hmm. So they drive no. by and uh, but we also have it on the agenda and stuff. Um, this isn't, I was surprised myself that R7 uses were not allowed in C3, particularly with um, um, allowing in um, C3 uh, group homes of 20 or more. Um, the other thing is that I don't know why if the, we've got big houses in C3 that have limited use if we don't allow them to be, I mean, this this big house, um, we the person that owns it either has to tear it down or find an unusual family. I'm not arguing with any of that. Okay. I, I completely agree with you. I'd like to see every one of okay. them used. But I, I feel like we're trying to... This looks like to me, or feels like to me, a workaround so they don't have to come in, we don't run into the same thing that we did with Jeremiah's project. That's what it feels like to me. And all I'm saying is, I'm for that facility. I think those are amazing. I think the work they do is great. But I just feel like we're going out there and we're throwing another thing into a specific zoning category that's going to take that option from those property owners. Well, and so that's where I Certainly, have an issue. if you think <coughs> that we shouldn't have R7 and C3, and if you think that the only way to allow for R7, um, you know, if, if the, we do use by review because we're thinking it is compatible, but we need to make sure that the particular circumstances warranted and it goes to the MAPC and it can be appealed to the mayor board of commissioners if that's not you know if 
you definitely don't want R7 in C3, then we shouldn't pass an ordinance. But use by review seems to be a good middle ground that wouldn't require people to down zone mm -hmm. property that already <coughs> is zoned C3. So use by review, then they would be able to come in, put up a sign, and anybody around there would be able to come in and voice an opinion then. Absolutely. And, and actually, we put the sign up, I believe. I believe we right, put it up, right, don't I, we? I, right. Yes. I okay. Um, but, but why do they only get that for a boarding house? If I, if I have that house and I call it a hotel, I don't need anything. Because hotels and motels are allowed in C3. It's just, I don't think, I, I, I don't agree with your characterization. I think this is a thing arose and we, it came to Carol's attention that we have a, a fluke, an error in our zoning. A, and oh, this isn't on just its own, apropos of the, the specific instance that gave rise to, the, um, to noticing the error, that just, it doesn't make sense on its own. And that if it doesn't make sense on its own, and it, there's also, I think, some, you have to do some balancing. Not everybody gets a say in what their neighbors do in their property. And we have the lowest say on what neighbors have in their, what you, you know, what your neighbor can do with their property when it's zoned C3. If I've got C3, uh, if I've got C3 zoning, and that's, keep in mind, that is just what we're talking about. We are only talking about C3. That. And so I, I feel like we should have a very low ability for an annoyed neighbor to tell me what I can't do on my property in a C3 zoning because that's what C3's for. I can have a movie theater, I can have a hotel, and if I call my boarding house a motel, a really small motel, then the neighbor can't do anything about it anyway. Yes, I understand that, Ben, but there's a big difference in that and what they're wanting to use it for. Big difference. But we're not looking at what they're wanting to use it for, we are looking at an ordinance change. But that's that what this broadly all come about. This is how this all come about was because of that though. Well, but sometimes we also see things in our ordinances because someone brings it to our attention that okay. should be corrected on their own basis. Okay. okay. Well, so the great what? thing is, what I hear in my head is Chris Bauer saying the most power this body has is when they change oh, yes, the zoning or allow the uses yeah. of zoning. So it's good to, to question and consider and debate it. In the end, we're going to probably have to bring something to you in some form or fashion that you guys will vote on. Mm -hmm. You know how that process works. Yeah. You can't vote down Well, just put them both on the agenda, and we'll we'll approve one of them or we won't. I mean, I think we just wrap our seven up at C3, and it's the simplest, cleanest. It's the most easily understood. It's not adding any additional burden for somebody who wants to do something. And, yeah, some neighbors are not going to have a say, but I'm not sure neighbors always need to say anyway. I mean, you know, I've got yeah, a, but it, I have a transitional. It's not going to be up to me to take that away from them. Well, but it I, is. I mean, I mean that, well, that's, that's what we do. No, it's not. Uh, sometimes no, it is. We are preserving the property right of the C3 owner. Them and all the property owners around them, not just the one. Well, but at some point, David, it's the basis we decide how much deference we're willing to give neighbors on what their property owners or what their. I know what they Gerald's do. got the. Just bring it back, Gerald. Yeah. Both sides. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll bring it. You guys yeah. will decide. And as always, it's one line in. You know, you can either not do it. It's not a big deal to add it here or add it there. Yes, but I will, I will, we will notice and we will put it together. And the only other thing I'd add is that I, I would worry that if we do do that and add that into the use, we start making a list of things that get used by review in C3, then when I got somebody who comes to me and says, hey, they went and built a, a hotel next door to me, and I didn't have any say over it. And these folks got all this input on this boarding house. Well, why don't why isn't a hotel on use by review too? And all of a sudden, we have people coming to us every time they're pissed off that their neighbors did something. No, I can and see say, where that would be. Hey, let's add that to use by review, no. and we could theoretically know. add this whole laundry list. I'm just not sure we want to open that can of worms for for a boarding house. I mean, the the other use by review examples are uh, adult entertainment and big warehouses. And a boarding house just, it seems to fit in with the list of the other stuff rather than the strip club. Is there any other considerations or thoughts that any of you would like to have in order <coughs> we bring back the two versions or three versions? Or? Less versions. Well, I'll bring, I'll bring two. <laughs> yeah, we don't need, two is enough. we don't uh, need to stay the same. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Just put one Sometimes. agenda item on with alternative language. You know, whatever. Okay. 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 Sounds good. We're ready for the next one. Anyone else? All right. Item number five. Discuss truck routes. I'll leave that to you, Gerald. Yeah, let me let me kick off the truck routes conversation. Uh, first of all, I'll say that I've been city manager for four and a half years. I've worked for the city for 14. And, and this truck route ordinance that is currently in place has been the same one that's been in place for about 10 years or so. Nothing's changed that I'm aware of anytime soon. However, what has changed is, is there's been some concerns and complaints that I've heard this year. And I know um, uh, uh, Mr. Stallings, you had talked to me too because you've heard some concerns as well. I think we have some people here tonight, um, Mayor, that uh, may want to speak too, and, and I think we should hear from. But this kind of gives you the base information for the truck route stuff. I appreciate Jackie putting this together for me. This is the truck route map. And we may not have this in a good place on the website. It is on the website. If you go up to the top and click on maps, you'll see a whole bunch of maps that are available. This is one of them, the PDF version. Um, this, so, so this is where this comes from. And I think we recently put out some info and we may try to make it more accessible to people. Because occasionally, and I should say occasionally from time to time, we do get complaints from uh, trucking companies about the truck routes. What I'm specifically talking about is the concern about the truck route. Um, from farmers, which, you know, agriculture is a valid and, and a very necessary part of the economy here. So we're very sensitive to that, too. But these are the current truck routes. They simply follow, for the most part, major highways. You can see 412 and 81, with a few exceptions here, and I think crossing here. Uh, one of the concerns I know that we've had is that uh, that's generated. Well, well, first of all, the chief will speak in a moment. We get complaints both ways. We get complaints from folks not able, from truckers not able to use the truck route, whether they're farmers or not. And we get complaints from citizens about wire trucks on a road other than the truck route. The reason that we have a truck route and the reason that we uh, set this up about 10 years ago was for several reasons. One was because certain roads are built better to handle the heavy truck traffic. A commercial truck of hauling anything weighs 80,000 pounds or something like that. Chief, you can weigh in more on, on that in a minute. Obviously, the highways are built better to withstand that. Um, so that was one concern. Um, congestion is always going to be another concern, um, but we're going to have <coughs> congestion whether it's on the truck route, the highway, or not. I did hear an interesting comment about, well, just build a bypass. That's from some of my Facebook friends out there. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't respond, bypass, but if we just had the money to build a bypass, we'd probably fix a lot of the roads we had before we built a bypass, because I bet you if we ask the business people in town, they don't want traffic going around the city. They want to come into the business. So anyway, here are some exceptions, because I want to make sure the public and everybody understood that the ordinance that we're following, I think we just put a snippet of the exceptions up here. But we don't, uh, um, if, if a truck's required to go there for some reason, obviously they have to get off the truck route at some point. Buses, military, transit, road construction, utility, uh, any kind of farm vehicle that's uh, less than 30 feet or 30 feet or less in length, that's not what we're talking about, I think. We're talking about 18 wheelers, whether it's hauling wheat or it's hauling uh, uh, petroleum products or whatever it's hauling. Uh, whatever this is, sport utility vehicles. Obviously, we don't stop any of that stuff. Um, so that's what we're talking about, semis. We're not talking about trucks like this, 30 feet and less. So that's what I wanted to uh, bring in and start the discussion and study session. Um, Commissioner, did you want to uh, say anything or speak directly? Well, I would just <coughs> say that I was approached uh, by uh, Mr. Hampton and he, he gave me a call and he was concerned and, and is, I'll introduce him in a second, but uh, Joe, Joe Hampton represents the heat, the wheat industry. He's, he's, and he can give you all the details about it, but uh, people in the wheat industry, as you know, during harvest, it's a, a two week, two and a half week period that there is intense traffic coming into Enid to our grain facilities. And it's an important part of our economy and there was uh, some trucks that weren't on the truck route and, and, and Joe had some concern about that. So, Joe, why don't you come up and give us a, a presentation on... on and okay. <coughs> Joe can't hear, so he'll do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm Joni O'Hampton. I'm uh, president of the Oklahoma Grain and Feed Association and used to be general manager of the Enum Board of Trade, uh, coming up on 48 years. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity we have here to discuss uh, this issue today. I'll tell you what, where the big problem is. Where's the bridge, the overpass? <laughs> on the, <laughs> so, that's, yeah. That is the problem. That scares, those, those, it scares me to drive over in my pickup and really scares the people hauling grain to go over that thing. And it looked like to me it's going to be a while before that's going to get fixed. So what they were probably doing is looking for a ways not to have to drive over North Van Buren overpass. Mm -hmm. And wheat harvest, like you said, it, what Rob said, it's, but Scott, maybe 10 days. So Scott Carroll, he's the general manager of ADM Grain here in Eden, the old Union Equity. Yeah. Ten, ten, um, go ahead. Uh, first, I apologize for the address. I was not scheduled to be here today. So, um, again, Scott Keller, regional manager for ADM Grain. Uh, serve on Joe's board for the Oklahoma Grain and Feed. So, um, this is not on behalf of ADM, not one bit at all. We've had a lot of concerned customers of ours um, with the truck routes. And you know, like what you presented earlier with a 30 foot truck, that's not how a lot of our customers, not any of our customers anymore these days, they don't haul with the tandem. And, you know, they have semis, they need to get grain to market efficiently um, now more so than ever, especially in this wheat harvest where you're delayed with rains and everything else. So we've had a lot of calls on our side. I appreciate you guys letting us come talk here just to express that concern, um, and especially moving forward here through, throughout the years. Um, this grain market's tight. These guys have to go to the best value. If any of you in here own land, um, you know how tight this grain market is today. Uh, so we want to present an opportunity for every producer around this area. Um, and our customer base is probably about 550 people throughout Enid. Um, and a lot of those landlords, producers alike, um, and they're concerned on it as well and because they have to go to the best value uh, with how tight things are. And, um, the grain market has changed. And like I said earlier, these guys are hauling the semis today more so than ever. They're not hauling with tandems, and they, they need to be able to get it to town. And the truck routes that, I mean, the main places we have, we struggle with and we get concerns and calls on from our customer base. And I'm not talking just from ours, CGDs alike. Anyone down here downtown is Willow, coming in from Northwest, and then individuals coming down from the South through Southgate. And when this route came out, especially this map that was put on the, um, the website, which I saw in there was the latest news, one of the top things, is Southgate because that Southgate coming up to 30th is you know a lot of our customers travel that as well. So um, we want to work with you guys as much as we possibly can. We've invested a lot of money in this town, especially with the mill and also our grain side. We employ a lot of people, and we want to work with you guys as best as we can. Whether that's information before harvest starts, where you guys know when trucks are going to start picking up throughout town, so we can, you know, safety is a huge thing with ours at ATM as well. So we want to make sure you guys are aware as possible. What, what do you do you guys have a specific request or specific chunk that we should consider adding if the road bed will support the additional traffic if the road bed will support the additional traffic willow from the west is a, i mean it's, that is a route and that's a lot, a lot of that's drawn from the timely you know how much time it takes to get down 412 and up 81 to come east um, so willow is one that a lot of our customers would like to use and then Southgate coming around, so you avoid that traffic coming to the northeast. So are they are they wanting to come up off 412 and head north on Wheat Ridge up to Willow and cut over? Or Garland. A lot of Garland. 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 Okay. Garland. Garland. So and if they're coming from the south, they pick Garland. Um, but a lot of our customers, you know, are coming up to the northwest on yeah. take country roads to Willow and then come on in. Gotcha. So. I, I think, like Scott said, the the, the days of where you saw the old red two ton Chevy truck are gone. Every every custom harvester has a com has a semi. Mm -hmm. That's the way that grain is going to come to eat. It's going to come in. I bet you don't dump. Maybe one or two. Wait, yeah, bobtails. So that those are gone. Those days are gone. You know, we my when I first started, you had a 14 foot combine. You had a truck to hold 250 bushels. Today, it's combines <laughs> they have 35, 40 foot headers, uh, and they'll have semis. So. We, you know, thankfully, we finally got harvest over. Uh, but maybe before next year, we can sit down and and see uh, talk about what we can do so everybody will be on the on the same page. And we're not in the middle of harvest. And I got got to call <laughs> have to call Rob. Say what's going on? I've never we never had this before. So <coughs> we want to work with you uh, very much so and and to see 
keep everybody safe. And uh, yet, but this wee farmer who, you know, he, he puts it to the ground in September and he prays he doesn't have drought, he prays he doesn't have flood, and he prays he doesn't have hail, he doesn't have trade wars, and he, and he has a good market price. So a lot of those this year, you know, so anyway, we're not talking about a very long period, but 10 days, two weeks max. That's in rest of the time, the, the, the commercial guys don't know what the truck route is. And uh, yeah. the ones that don't are the custom cutters that come in from North Dakota and Minnesota and Canada. And, and yeah, I'll probably on the website, but I'll bet you I'm ready to have them checked. So, but we need to, we know next year before harvest, uh, what we'll do, we'll work with Scott and we'll work with the folks at CGB. And uh, so we're all on the same page. Everybody knows kind of what the game plan will be. But thank you very can, much for the opportunity. Can I yes, ask sir. a question? I thought we were talking about Ben at Garland and Willow. Will that roadbed support tractor trailer 80, 90,000 pounds back and forth over and over and over? I don't know the answer to that. It sounds like an engineering question. They'd probably have to have time to study. It'd be my guess, no. It'd be a yeah. hard turn. And so that would be the difficulty in trying to extend it yeah. just on Willow. But even if the new portion of Willow from uh, Cleveland to Oakwood could do it, and the old portion, which is showing its age, if you, mm -hmm. um, the roads getting there, well, I'm pretty I, certain aren't built to handle. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be our challenge, trying to figure out and which is why we have had this this map for a while. Yeah. So I, as most of you know, I <clears throat> happen to be married in a family that has a couple trucks, and they, uh, I, I called and talked to them a little bit, and they looked at that map and suggested, just suggested that all that traffic coming in from the west going east, come in on 412, go all the way down to 30th. That's a good road up, and turn back, and it only takes you about a mile out of the way. Yeah, that's uh, not the, go ahead, sorry. Well, I mean, it, it it would also keep you off of that big overpass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it seems like that would make a lot of sense to do that. I know you've mm -hmm. got to go through downtown or through Enid on 412, which is incredibly uh, busy yeah, all the time. Is. I do, I do understand that. Nervous, but yeah. And lots of lights. <laughs> well, we're working on the work on the line. We're not getting those work. Maybe we'll have an improvement on that. But the other thing is, too, is to get these guys back to the farm, get back to that field as quickly and as efficient as possible. You know, it's going to take them an extra probably 20, 25 minutes, as we all know, going down 412 to get into that northeast side of, you know, Willow and 30th, basically. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's where the gray elevators are now. The, uh, the only other two that are still operation uh, got frac sand. So. <laughs> Yeah. ADM grain, the mill, and still Johnson CGV are the only two left that are taking in grain. They're taking a lot of grain, and they happen to all be on 30th Willow. Well, I mean, I feel like it makes sense to at least look at the, the roadbed, but when we have, I mean, even a couple weeks of heavy traffic can really tear the hell out of the road. And when we've had, I mean, just when we've had to rebuild an intersection, I can't remember which intersection it was, it was a year or two ago, that it had very briefly some road uh, heavy truck traffic and I think it was, I can't remember what Gdansky said, but it was something about the force from stop turning of those front wheels turning and then going off. Just it's the amount of damage that can happen really quickly mm -hmm. and how expensive it is to go replace the intersection work. And if we can, if we have roads that can support it, then it kind of makes, you know, I don't have a great harbor, but even a couple weeks on roads that won't support it can cost us a boatload of money. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be worth looking into just to see yeah it doesn't hurt to look what, what's with this chunk of south gate that's half a mile on i don't know that's a, that's a county road okay so <laughs> that's outside the city limits so we don't so they pay to fix it anyway who cares you can go all the way on south gate <laughs> <laughs> but, but i can tell by i mean we probably should have a county commission if you want to take your road by, by, by your own hands you go down south yeah yeah, that's yeah right. by, by looking at it it's <laughs> not a it's at least parts of it don't appear to be built mm -hmm. to handle heavy truck traffic <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Any further discussion? Chief, come on up because I, I neglected you. You. Uh, I, I want to say, I want to say something for the chief on the chief's behalf. It's all his fault. What the chief and police do is simply enforce the law and enforce the code. <laughs> so that's probably what he's going to say. I'm done. <laughs> 
the, the only dog in the fight that we have on this is the enforcement. We enforce the truck route that the commissioners put together back about eight, nine years ago. Now, the issues that we have with trucks in this town is not just harvest, but it's sandbox trucks, cattle haulers, pig haulers. Go out on standby Garriott and you're going to get 10, 15 trucks every 10 minutes. So there is some issues with that. Some of the trucks that are coming back, uh, you know, cutting down Garland, cutting down Oakwood, those roads aren't really built for that, I'm going to guess. Uh, I, and I used to, and, and Joe Neal knows, I used to work harvest years ago back in the 80s when trucks were all the way down Willow, uh, stuck at Van Buren, and I was dumping trucks, and they'd come in 120,000 pounds or more. Uh, and it was ruining Willow at the time, and it was just nothing but divots. So to put a truck on a, on a road that's not rated is going to be an issue, it, whether it be a sandbox truck, whether it be a 100,000-pound wheat truck or whatever. So that's damage that could be caused that you all are going to have to fix. I mean, because the roads are going to be tore up. Some of the dirt roads, uh, I don't know bridges, but I think there's some old WPA bridges probably still out there. They're only rated about five tons. So, you know, if, if one of those goes down city limits, then that's on, on, that's on you all to fix. So, you know, we are in the last, I do have some stats, just since April 1st, we've written 20 citations for truck route, just not here recently, but since April, and 30 warnings. So, and that's just not wheat trucks. In the month of June, which might have been wheat trucks, uh, we've done uh, about eight citations and about 15, 18 warnings. So, you know, it, it, it just depends on what you all want to do. If you want to change the truck route, you can change it. I mean, we'll enforce whatever. Uh, you know, I'd be careful about selective enforcement. Selective enforcement is no good deed. And, you know, if we didn't do some trucks, then we're going to have sandbox trucks, frack trucks, haulers, the windmill blades coming through. They're going to be saying, why? Why, why? why can't we go this way? I get it on the North Van Buren overpass. It scares me going over in a car. So, but there are alternate routes around it. I don't know if Willow, you know, West Willow from Oakwood is, is probably substantial enough. I don't know. But, you know, it's the damage that can be caused. I'll enforce whatever you all want. And as it stands, we're going to enforce this. Um, any questions? It's a it's a conundrum, that's for sure. So that's it. All righty then. What what are we looking at on? Uh, this is not from the chief. But oh. On the overpass, are we looking at maybe one or two more harvests? I, I think it probably won't be complete by next year. One side will be complete. One side will be completely rebuilt relatively shortly. The other side is pretty close. So one more harvest, I think. Okay. Surely it shouldn't be two. And we are working on traffic synchronization. That's something else Michael's been tasked with. So. <laughs> Michael, all your objectives are out in the open now. So. No kidding. Very good. Hey, I see that Alan Brooks stepped in. Hey, Alan. Um, there was a question early on. Uh, Commissioner Mason, I don't think he's met you yet. Uh, Alan Brooks, our partner from uh, Public Law Finance Group, has a long history with uh, his company working with the city and he's going to talk to us upstairs but we you know we still have some time if you want to ask anything down here no i was just want to make sure what the agreement was i so yeah, the no, agreement i'll wait on the presentation i think i probably already said enough tonight yeah the fee agreement is i think a half time. percent <laughs> Did you, did you already give kind of a high-level overview? Actually, I didn't get into the agreement. I kind of talked about the history, but do you want to give the high-level overview I, and talk about the John's agreement? John's not here. I, you, when, when John Wolf comes in, your financial advisor, you can say, John, glad you were late. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he gives a point off his fee, right? Uh, you, you, want, you want to come up to the microphone? and So I don't have any numbers in front of me, but I can talk, again, kind of high-level with everybody. Uh, what we're talking about this evening is refinancing a portion of the Clean Water SRF loan that refinanced the wastewater treatment plant. Working from memory, I think that was a series 2010 issue. Uh, about, uh, there, there's, there's two things we're trying to accomplish in this process. One, uh, of that transaction, in round numbers, about 45% of that 
loan came out of Oakland Water Resources Board bond proceeds. When we have proceeds from the Water Board's bonds that are tax exempt, that we have to make sure that we don't enter into any, any agreements that would impact the tax exemption on that transaction. If we refinance those dollars, that 45% uh, from, with the Water Board and we utilize cash that the Water Board has versus bond proceeds, then we're not subject to those same restrictions in terms of, uh, as an example, private activity limitations relative to the wastewater treatment plant. That would provide us some flexibility in entering into potentially agreements to sell effluent from the wastewater plant that wouldn't, again, tie our hands with federal tax rules. Um, so we have met with staff at the Oakland Water Resources Board, discussed with them the flexibility that could be obtained by refinancing uh, a component uh, of the transaction, about $10.7, $10.75 million, I believe, in, in rough numbers. Um, the added advantage is that the transaction, if we refinanced it based on rates today, it would drop the interest rate from about 2.81%, uh, which was the rate when we closed, that's the all-in rate, including the administrative fee, to about 1.76% all-in rate, including administrative fee. So uh, transaction costs are in round numbers, slightly over 1%. The fees uh, for our firm are half percent of the principal amount, same with municipal finance services. I think we each had 2,500 expenses and a trustee bank acceptance fee. So let's, let, let, let's call it that in a nutshell. Uh, gross savings, if we, based on rates today, would be about $769,000 over the life of the transaction. After transaction costs, it would save the city, again, round numbers, about 650000 uh, the rate wouldn't be set until after the water board, well, one, until this body approved it, until the Oklahoma Water Resources Board considered it by their board, which would happen at their August meeting. But uh, the rate would be set at that time. I mean, I mean, theory is if you could refinance tax exempt debt with taxable debt and get the same rate, I mean, that'd be great. We would we'd have the flexibility to do what we needed to do and we wouldn't have the uh, encumbrances of federal tax law. If we can do it and drop the interest rate, um, that's, that's, that's gravy. Are there any right. downsides to doing that? I mean, what, what would be the... Zero. I, I mean, none that I can come up with. Okay. Uh, again, we have, <laughs> we have less compliance issues when we're, we're doing this with out of water board cash. All of our tax consequences go away relative <clears throat> to the financing. And again, we're, I mean, this is a loan that's only prepayable with Oakland Water Resources Board's consent, okay? So assuming their, their board agreed to do this, I mean, uh, then they would be waiving that consent and, uh, and allowing us to refinance at today's interest rates versus the rates that we had when we closed the loan in 2010. Both very, very attractive rates, but I mean, I mean we're, you know, we're talking about, again, dropping the rate a little over 100 basis points, again, based on rates today are 1%, and on $10.7 million, that, that, that's, that's where we end up. Easy. <clears throat> Save us 600 grand any time you'd like, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I, again, that's high level. John's going to have more specific numbers. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the big picture. I'll be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> any further discussion? I hear none, so this meeting's adjourned. We'll go upstairs. Yep, that's good. Yep. Thank you for watching the Enid Television Network broadcast of the Enid City Council Study Session. Replays of the meeting will air on Channel 12 and 112, including a live stream of the meeting at enidtv.org.